And I'm actually not going to do uh, too many uh, introductions, although these are both incredibly, incredibly impressive people. So Danielle Allen is uh, to my far left. Um, and Danielle, when I met her, I don't know, probably 13 years ago or something, was on faculty at the University of Chicago, um, has two PhDs, one in political philosophy and one in classics. Um, and then became the Dean of the Humanities and now is at the Institute for Advanced Studies um, in Princeton, New Jersey. She wrote a book called Our Declaration, um, which looks like this and which I believe we're gonna have copies for sale after the, after the talk um, tonight. And it's really this book that inspired this conversation along with watching Liz Dozier, who is the principal at Fenger High School after watching her on Chicago Land, but after also having heard for years about the amazing job that she's doing in turning around um, you know, a, a neighborhood Chicago public school, which is no easy task. Um, and I began to wonder um, what these two women might have to say to each other. So um, maybe I'll just start the conversation um, by asking Danielle to talk us, to us a little bit about her, uh, about her new book, um, which is an investigation of equality as a um, result of her close reading with Odyssey Project students um, in the Declaration of Independence. Great, thanks Angel, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's, I lived in Chicago for 10 years, 97 to 2007, and it is so deep in my heart. I mean, you all know it's impossible to get Chicago out of your heart once you move here. So it's just terrific to be back, and I really appreciate it, and great to see friends in the audience also. Um, so our declaration, uh, the subtitle is a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality. And Angel, at the end there, um, noted that the book itself grew out of a class I taught through the Illinois Humanities Council, a class called the Odyssey Project, which is a course in the humanities for adults roughly at the poverty line. And uh, its premise is you use texts to dig into big philosophical issues, historical issues, social issues. And I found myself sort of early on gravitating toward using the Declaration of Independence for the simple reason that it's short. You know, <laughs> literally 1,337 words. But none of my students had ever read it from start to finish. And once I started teaching in the Odyssey Project, I started bringing it into my classes at the University of Chicago as well and discovered that in that context too, barely any of the students had read the text from start to finish. And I was like, what, really? It's like 1,300 words and we haven't read the whole thing? And I realized too, when I started to take it more seriously, that it makes an incredibly coherent and powerful argument about equality. And not just in the famous bits you know, so it's not just in the all men are created equal bit, but the equality theme is woven all the way through. It gives us a really rich account of political equality that goes well beyond issues of voting rights and includes things, in my argument, like educational empowerment and really underscores the importance of disseminating educational resources broadly for the sake of achieving egalitarian empowerment throughout a democratic community. So the short of it about the book really is that it's just an effort to get everybody to re-engage in those 1300 words in order to take the equality concept seriously. And maybe the last thing I'll say about that is we are all talking all the time about inequality at the moment. And obviously that's a hugely important subject, but from my point of view, you can't do anything about inequality unless you actually understand equality. And I think frankly that we're confused on that subject because you have to figure out how to relate the economic questions of economic opportunity or justice or fairness to issues of social equality to political equality. And so for me, the goal is, as I said, egalitarian empowerment for all people so that everybody can be a co-creator of our shared democratic community that requires empowerment along other dimensions. And again, I would say edu educational empowerment is one of the most fundamental pieces of that story. So, Danielle, can you go into some of the content of the book about what equality is? Um, you talk about it being more than just sort of freedom from oppression. And um, you know, I was really inspired by some of what you're suggesting in that book to think about, edu about education. Sure, so, um, so I, in the book I basically argue that there are five facets to the concept of political equality as the Declaration lays it out. Um, the first is a non-domination idea, really the sense that people need space for autonomous action and they need to be protected against domination by other people. I won't tell you exactly where that comes at in the, in the text right now. I'll let you, you can buy the book, okay, if you want to know. <laughs> where in the Declaration does it talk about that? If that sounds implausible, you can buy the book and find out. 
Um, and then the second one, of course, is the famous sentence, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. But that sentence, it's longer than everybody realizes. It doesn't end at, you know, that they've all got these rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It carries on through the idea that, you know, we, we institute governments to protect those rights. And when the governments are protecting those rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we have the right to alter and abolish them. So the point is, that's a right to egalitarian access to the instrument of politics, to government. Um, and so there's a really important idea of opportunity in that uh, particular portion of the Declaration. The third facet is what I call, um, you know, sorry, sort of technical word, but epistemic egalitarianism, which means epistemic is a word for knowledge. Okay, so it means both that when you think about collective decision making, it's really important to draw the whole community into decision making, to combine lay social knowledge with expert knowledge and to understand how to weave those together. And the way that comes out in the Declaration is that that long list of grievances, the complaints against King George, wasn't produced by an expert commission working behind closed doors. The folks in Continental Congress literally put ads in the paper in all the colonies and said, tell us what's wrong. Tell us what you see that's problematic in what King George has been doing. And then there were networks of conversation and then also literally you know, people putting posters up saying, come to Farmer Jones's field on Sunday to talk about what's going on. So it's you know, really a conviction that knowledge that's relevant to how we shape our lives can come from everywhere and does come from everywhere. And that collective decision making depends on you know, equipping a citizenry to succeed in that work of collective knowing, collective discussing, collectively <coughs> figuring out where we're going, what we should do about it. So that's where the educational piece comes in. I mean, you need strong education to support that kind of commitment to um, egalitarianism about the use and production of knowledge. Fourth facet, sorry, this is getting a bit long. Um, I'll try to wrap it up, is uh, reciprocity, egalitarianism in our social relations. Um, and so that is a matter of recognizing that as we interact with each other and with strangers and so forth, we need to be able to protect equal spaces for action amongst us. And if some people are encroaching, again, on the sort of autonomy space of others, you need to be able to push back. Um, and then the last facet of equality is what I call equality of co-ownership and co-creation. In the last sentence of the Declaration, the 56 members of the Continental Congress mutually pledge their lives, their liberties, and their sacred, for their, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to one another. And so they share, they, they take a, an ownership stake in the thing they're building together, and because they each represented a specific colony, which was becoming a, a state, they're actually taking an ownership stake as well for their whole colony or state. So they conclude by recognizing that on the basis of this egalitarian bond that they've formed in their conversations and through this document, they're co-owning the polity, the political being body that they're creating. Um, and so that's where, finally, for me, the idea of egalitarian empowerment comes together. Ultimately, the goal in a democracy is to empower everybody in this egalitarian way such that everybody can experience in real, you know, real life, sort of in their bones, the idea that they're a co-creator and co-owner of the polity. We're a long way from achieving that. Um, so I think that's where the conversation with Liz comes in. Well, let me ask one more question before we um, go to Liz. Is there a reason why we should give more weight to the Declaration of Independence than other texts where we might take away a notion of what equality is? Well, I mean, there are lots of valuable texts for thinking about equality, so it's not that I think this is the end all and be all, I just think it's a very valuable starting point. And I think it's a starting point that we've neglected. I mean, it's a text that you know, just really hasn't gotten that much attention lately, and yet it has an incredibly coherent and quite radical argument in it. People, I think, dismiss it a lot because they attribute the writing of it to Jefferson. They think Jefferson was a slaveholder. What did he know about equality and so forth? And while it's true that he was the lead draftsman for the committee of five people who wrote the Declaration, the other members of the committee were, among them, John Adams and Ben Franklin, both genuine egalitarians. And it's really Adams who drove the process that led to the writing of the Declaration, and he got Jefferson elected to the, to the Drafts, draftsman role for the committee. There's a heck of a lot more of Adams in the document than we usually recognize. And so I think we've been neglecting it because we think it's really Jefferson's voice we hear, but it's Adams too. And we need to understand that and take in those egalitarian arguments. 
And the last thing I'll mention before I really do go to Liz um, is something you talk about vis-a-vis -vis Adams, which I was really surprised to read, and maybe it means I'm a complete idiot. But when he says that the purpose of government or the end of government is the happiness of the people, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Adams. It's not Jefferson. It's Adams. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is the formulation that those who did not want to defend slavery used. The defenders of slavery included the word property whenever they used formulations of that kind. They would talk about protecting life, liberty, and property. And George Mason, another Virginian, had drafted a similar document that Jefferson was drawing on for the Declaration. The Mason document has property in it. A Adams had, for the whole year, been publishing stuff on the, the idea that the point of government was happiness. And you can trace this through, to, I mean, in other ways, too. The, the Virginians are continually invoking property. And the people who end up on the anti-slavery side of things, including Dickinson of Pennsylvania, who was the only signer to free his slaves, which he did, I can't remember the exact years, but something like eight years or so after the Declaration, um, he, too, focused on happiness and well-being concepts and would not use the property concept. So. If we sort of go along with Adam's notion that, um, that the end of government is to um, is the happiness of its people, then I want to go to education in Chicago. Um, and you know, I sort of come to this with two things in mind. One is that our government was created to ensure the happiness of the people um, who are governed and uh, this notion that Danielle has pointed out that uh, in order to be treated equally means that we have to have an equal stake in creating our culture. Um, so can we sort of apply that to, to the young people who go to CPS? What would it actually require? Well, I guess first I could ask the question to not appear cynical and say whether or not you feel like those are things that we actually afford to young people, the young people that you're serving as a principal. Um, and whether we're doing that um, or not, or if we're not doing that fully, what does it require to ensure that young people do become full political participants and shapers of our culture? So good evening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is no. And next question. Um, <laughs> um, I was talking to a group of students uh, about two weeks ago, and um, because of you know the show and recent things, I have I've had the opportunity, and I told them I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of really cool people. And I asked them, well, that's you guys, you're the cool people. <laughs> and I asked them, you know, what what do you want people to really know in terms of what you feel like you need and what you feel like would make a difference in your life? Because I get asked this question. And so I think it ties into, into your question as well. And they said three things. And it was a, a variety of students. So it wasn't all the students who had straight A's. And it wasn't all the students who you know, might be in other activities, maybe aren't so positive. But there was three common themes that I found in, in talking with them. And the first had to, do, uh, had to do with safety. And not just safety in terms of getting to and from school, although that came up constantly, just you know, feeling safe you know, just in traveling and being out in the world um, because of some of the trauma and issues that you know, our students just unfortunately naturally face within the context of their community. But safety in terms of emotional safety, both within the context of their families and in the context of like relationships with adults and these types of things. Um, they also talked about having a voice. And I think our young people often don't, uh, they don't have that within the context of our community, our larger community, they just don't have a voice. I think it's often uh, pushed aside in, in larger conversations about youth. Um, I, I've spoken at you know, several events and different things, and it's often interesting in that we're talking about youth and community, and oftentimes they're, they're nowhere in the room or nowhere at the table. And so just you know, really having their voices heard. And then the, the last thing really boiled down to hope. And I mean, they've said it in a variety of different ways, but basically it was hope that they're wanting to have, feel like there's something more for them. I think a lot of um, our young people are often disenfranchised and feel like there's not really a place for them within um, 
you know, society and larger community in cer within certain spaces. And so those were the things that they talked about. And so uh, I think the short version of the answer, I think, it, it is no. Um, but I think that there are a lot of great people um, within, you know, our, not only within Chicago, but more broadly speaking within our country and even beyond that are really thinking about how to really engage youth within, um, yeah, within that to help them have that voice. And how do we grant young people that? I mean, if if young people, you know, in in the show, there's a moment where there's this young woman who um, says that she would love to go to school, but she's afraid of being killed on the way there. Um, so if young people are sort of dealing with basic issues of safety, um, and if or if basic issues of safety are barriers to getting an education. Like, you know, what are the things that as a CPS principal do you have to do to ensure that young people have an opportunity at a good education? So I think just from my perspective, what I've kind of seen over this last four or so years in being a principal is that the empowerment and having them have that voice or that space is not something that I grant to them or we as adults grant to them. I think it's letting them, it's almost this idea of like open space for them and ha them having different experiences in which to realize their own power and their own voice within them and then giving them opportunities to actualize that and put that into practice. And so spaces can often look like, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Mikva Challenge. They do a lot of, I see a lot of nodding heads, um, they do a lot of um, just general work on democracy with youth and helping them engage within the political process. So again, giving them that space and showing them how their voice matters. It does become difficult and challenging when our young people are in communities that they don't really see that they have a voice or power or there are very challenging, challenging situations and circumstances. Um, I had a young man in my office not too long ago, towards the beginning of the year, and I was talking with his mother, and he was just totally turned off to school. I mean let's not even talk about empowerment, he was just turned off with life, like just in general. And his mom and I were trying to figure out a plan for him and she was just saying, you know, he's lost over the course of this last two years, uh, 12 friends that have, have died. And so really thinking about how do you empower a, a, a young person, a young man like that, to help him see that his voice does matter and that he is empowered when they do deal with, our students do deal with things that are very um, tragic within that. Was I remember there was a sort of two part of this American life that dealt with um, safety in Chicago public schools. Mm -hmm. Was Fanger the high school that was Harper, Harper, Harper. High School? Okay, so there was a story, and um, another one of those stories that sort of had me dead in my tracks, where there was this young man who was always seeing the guidance counselor, um, and. Um, I can't remember the name of the gentleman who did this story, the guy who wrote There Are No Children Here. I'm sure you all know him, Alex Kotlowitz. <laughs> but Alex like goes to the school and is constantly seeing this young man in the office sort of waiting to talk to the, um, to the guidance counselor. And so after a while, begins to talk with this young man over time. And he notices that the young man always talks about, or always sort of, reflects a fear of sort of doing something harmful. But the young man had never really done anything harmful. And so Alex was sort of confused as to why he always seemed to have this concern. And in talking with this young man over time, we learn that um, this young man had seen two people shot and killed sort of within six feet of his body and seen many, many more people killed, but not quite so physically close to him when they were killed. And this, I mean, so that should freak me out enough, but, um, but then the young man said that he never sleeps well, and that there was a day when someone was teasing his little brother or something, and he punched the guy, and he punched him so hard that the guy's tooth became lodged in his hand and he had to go to the emergency room to get the tooth removed, and that was the only night in many, many years that he slept soundly. 
And I thought, okay, so that means I think that the one chance that this kid had to sort of express violence was the only time that he could sleep well. I mean, what, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> and um, I mean, it just sort of, it made me so afraid about what our future looks like. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as I sort of watched you work, and I, yeah, I met Liz for the first time yesterday, but as I watched you work, I was so amazed at how many job descriptions you had. And in the final episode, it became fundraiser. You know, it was like yet another job description, like layered one after the other. And it just, to me, it's, unf I mean, I don't know how you do it, first of all. Um, and I'm wondering how we can fix it. That's a big question. Yeah. That's, a, that's a huge question. Um, so don't answer it now. Yeah. Maybe I'll come back <laughs> in a couple of minutes. But let me ask a, a question to Danielle and the two of you are welcome to ask each other questions or even ask me one if you want to. But um, Danielle, can you talk about the Odyssey Project and what it is that you um, think that students are being sort of given or granted in that course and, and what you think students contribute as a result of their participation? Sure, I, I will respond to that, but I'd like to actually respond to the last question for a second, um, partly in order to say, everybody always wants to know from the principal <laughs> what we can do to fix it, but it is so much a matter of what's outside the schools as well as what's inside the schools. I mean, there's a lot that principals can do, but frankly, from my point of view, there's a lot more that the rest of us right. need to be doing. Yeah. And so I take the real issue to be one of quite broad reconstitution, social reconstitution. And there are a number of different things you can point to. I mean, you look at the issue of inequality and the question of whether there are jobs available that can support middle class ways of living. You have to look at the way in which police, policing functions in any major metropolitan area. From my point of view, you have to look at the drug laws. And from my point of view, the fundamental issue is you have big communities that are, um, you know, not integrated into the world of law that protects the rest of us, asks things of us, protects the rest of us, but that, that's gone on for too long. And from my point of view, it's time to bring people back in. For me, that's actually a matter of legalization. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and put that out there, okay? I think that's actually one of the most important things that could be done for the sake of educational reform, okay? <laughs> So anyway, having said that, I'll answer your question about the Odyssey Project, <laughs> okay? Which relates, actually, I mean, insofar as the Odyssey Project, um, I mean, for me, I feel selfish about it because it was one of the most profound teaching experiences I've ever had. I mean, I learned more from my Odyssey Project students, my adult students who were navigating life in Chicago with all of its difficulties, right? So whether it's working multiple jobs and juggling childcare and nonetheless getting to class or dealing with so many innumerable deaths in the family, none of which really happen in the right kind of way, and so forth. And so to get, engage with texts of philosophy, literature, and that sort of thing, the students in the Odyssey Project classes, in my experience, were hungry for answers about life. They weren't trying to learn you know, what is the information that's gonna be on the test or the text, right? They were looking for genuine self-understanding and for an improved ability to articulate their own view of the world, right? And which relates to the voice question, right? So they, I think they were acquiring voices later in life than maybe would have been ideal, but they were. But then for me, the way it relates to the other question is that by engaging in adult education, one's also helping to build a bigger world that understands what education can do, should be, and can support teachers and principals in schools who are trying to achieve the same things. Again, you, know, you guys can't do it on your own. You need a bigger community of people who understands how education works, what its value is. And so I thought of the Odyssey Project, do think of it, and it's incredible now at this point, alumni community as itself actually being a contribution to the ed reform movement. 
I, I just want, I'm so happy to hear you say that around community because I think that's oftentimes left outside of the conversation when we talk about school reform, when we talk about what's going on in schools. It's a larger picture of communities and economic development and jobs and these, these much broader issues that don't really ever get talked about when we think about you know, schools. It somehow, somehow gets randomly just left out of the larger conversation. And when, when we created the Odyssey Project, we sort of created it with this idea that it was not to send people to college, but really to sort of give them the power of politics. Um, and I, you know, from your opening chapter, I think called Night School, you sort of demonstrate that. Um, and you know, what, if, if politics is about being able to shape culture, including political culture. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what that looks like for a 15-year-old mm -hmm. who lives in Roseland. Mm -hmm. And if we do provide the conditions for a productive education, um, apart from not growing up to be a drain on the system, which is what we talk about all the time, you know, what is it that these young people have to offer us? I mean, it sounds like a stupid question, right? Because we all sort of know the answer. But I, I want to ask it again in case we don't all know the answer. So what, you know, I mean, maybe you've already answered it. So what are the conditions we need to create? And what does a 15-year-old being political look like? So I'll throw something out that I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Liz. Um, so this is an example from the Boston Public Schools. And I imagine that there are things like this in Chicago, too. And so that's what I would love to know about. But um, I was very impressed by a program in Boston that I learned about a couple of years ago where the student councils um, in different Boston schools were connected to each other in a larger organization, the purpose of which was to respond to policy at the level of the central educational department office. Um, and so that they then became people who could contribute to the agenda setting of the Boston Public Schools mm -hmm. agenda and bring issues to the fore. And in some ways, I mean, it was, I think, partly because it was different school councils working together. Mm -hmm. Um, it elevated the discourse to a higher level. Like they really had to find common cause and so forth across multiple schools and learn things about each other, but then also learn things about how to interact with the mayor's office, the superintendent's office, and stuff like that. Um, and I, at any rate, I, so the, I would point to that as an interesting example. It sort of speaks to Liz's point about you've got to give young people the space to do things, to achieve things, to be efficacious actors. Um, I think at the, thinking about at the school level and how we kind of promote that and what we try to do is really in response to a lot of um, like discipline issues that arise. I'm sure many people in the room know the stats on expulsions and suspensions, particularly around African American males and arrests and these types of things. And so for us, it's um, not necessarily networking with other schools, and I, lo I love that idea. Um, for us, it, it kind of translates into how if, if you will, the, the students are governed. Uh, and so really trying to infuse restorative justice and have that be interwoven throughout the fabric of our school so that they have real voice within that. And so we have a full-time restorative justice person on staff who does peace circles. And so for those who don't know what peace circles are, basically, let's say we all have an issue, he sits us down and there's like a talking piece and we kind of work through our issues together. And I think what that allows, allows the students to do is have a voice so it's not an adult solving the problem, it's the adult facilitating, helping them you know, guide the conversation so it's not, you know, crazy. Because uh, you know how teenagers can be sometimes, uh, as adults can be too. Uh, and so uh, really helping, I think, guide that peer juries, like things like this to really allow them to, again, have that space and have that voice to decide like their own fate, if you will, and help them to resolve um, issues and these types of things. That's kind of one example I'd point to. Was it? How hard or how easy was it to decide that you would actually um, sort of have an entire staff position for someone doing that work? Because in the, I mean, you yeah. know, in Chicagoland, when the school sort of looks like it's going to lose $100,000 of funding, the 
question becomes whether or not you're able to keep the dean who does that work. Um, on the front end, how did you decide that that's a position that the school needed to have and that you would actually put serious money behind it? Yeah, so when Finger High School is a turnaround school and became so in 2009, and so with that, just for those who might not know what turnaround is, you basically have the opportunity um, to, the, the whole staff is removed, there's an infusion of about $1.6 million per year, and you really get to really rethink how you want to do school. And so looking around at just best practices in the country as a whole, we knew that restorative justice was something we wanted to just have as the foundation of our, of our school. Uh, and we tried initially to come in, I think the first year with restorative justice and, and do this. Um, the building was, um, I don't know if out of control is even an accurate enough wor word, but we had like 300 arrests inside of the building that school year for major, major uh, things that were happening within the building. And so when you think of that and juxtapose that with restorative justice, it kind of doesn't even seem like, you know, what, what are you talking, a peace circle and all this is going on? Yeah. So, um, but there came a point, I mean, there was some definitely setting of expectations and what we had, not, not rules, but expectations for the kids uh, initially when, when coming to the school. But there came a point when that almost tapped out and there was nothing else to do but give it back to them. Do you, or to, to, to have that space for them, because there was only so much that certain interventions and things could do. And so for us, it just became apparent that they, I think just by nature of some of the dynamics that are within the home and within the community, that's not all students, but there's a good percentage of students that you know, the message at home is, well, if someone does this to you, then you go ahead and you know you hit them or you do this. And so in, in trying to counter that narrative, like it became clear that we needed a full-time position. And it is, it is hard, like every year, we're, we're, I just finished my budget today, every year we have to make sacrifices in order to have this position. And then not only this position, but other positions that really support kids. So built into the course of the school day, we have things like anger management and grief counseling and trauma therapy and these things that are just interwoven within the normal course of our day. Um, so essentially mental health groups for students because I think that again I think it ties into what we're ta talking about giving them that voice because if they're not healthy if they're dealing with a lot of issues they're not even able to enter this space of being empowered because they don't even they haven't dealt with a lot of things that they have encountered and unfortunately our students encounter more than anyone would really ever ever believe what kinds of conversations take place in the peace circles our peace circle, it could be anything. Um, so adults have peace circles. I just had a peace circle with a staff member not too long ago. We had, Did somebody hit you? Like, is, that why, is that why you had to have a peace circle? Uh, we had a, an issue. So I asked for a peace circle. So this staff member and I went to a peace circle a couple weeks ago. So it's not just students. Um, it's adult to adult. It's student to adult. I had a student that had a peace circle with a teacher today. She swore to me. She came to me. She's like, Miss Dozier, you know, Miss such and such has it out for me. I know she has it out for me I can feel it what is she doing well she told me to stop talking and she told me I mean you know but from her perspective she really felt like there was an issue so she had a peace circle and you know the situation was resolved um, but a very serious issue so we've dealt with um, unfortunately within our larger broader community of roles and there are a lot of gang real real life gang issues that are happening and surrounding our school and so we've brought gang members um, in like adult members of gangs into the building to try to help resolve and just come to a, 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 a peacefulness within this, can you just keep it peaceful around this area of the school? So it ranges from you know smaller things to really serious larger things. Yeah. Um, there's this book with a really peculiar title that I love um, by this theorist Elaine Scarry. It's called The Body and Pain, The Making and Unmaking of the World. And um, I love this idea of making the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like, in a way, maybe that's what's happening in the peace circles, is that the world is being created. Mm -hmm. And um, Danielle, the book takes a turn for me that I wasn't expecting, I don't know why, um, about the importance of conversations. Mm -hmm. And you talk about how many conversations have to have taken place for the Declaration of Independence to be written. Mm -hmm. And you talk about how democratic writing, and I assume you mean both literal but also figurative democratic writing, requires conversation. Can you talk about that? 
Sure. I mean, I think Liz's examples are perfect examples of what I had in mind. So I would say that, yes, your peace circles are world-making efforts. And I mean, to some extent, I sit here and I think you know, a principal shouldn't have to be making a world of safety at that level. I mean, that's fundamental bedrock political work. That's the first thing any set of political organizations should be providing is the kind of security that makes it possible for kids to learn, right? So you are creating an alternative way of building a safe world. And so, I mean, it really is a kind of substitution for what in political science people would refer to as like failed, say, signs of failed state, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. um, at any rate, so yes, I mean, the point is that it's through you know, many, many, many conversations that people come to share meanings right, that give the world some definition and also um, establish protocols for resolving disputes. And you need those protocols for resolving disputes in order to have any possibility of safety and stability, right? So although, you know, when confronted with the problem of violence, one thinks that the necessary response is sort of somehow or other more violence or force, in fact, the necessary response is what it takes to hold communities in conversation together, right? Which is what you're building. Um, to what extent should we sort of um, um, should we give primacy to the Declaration of Independence? I feel like I feel a little shy about saying to some of my friends, um, "You should accept this notion of equality." And if you accept this notion of equality, then there are ways in which we as a country have to change our behavior. And I feel really shy about saying, you know, I've read this book about the Declaration of Independence, or if you look at the Declaration of Independence, it tells us that we need to do these things. Um, I mean, partly because we've all sort of made our own meaning out of these, um, out of these documents. But um, if I were to be less shy about um, about that, why do you think I can tell someone that the Declaration of Independence should still be given that kind of weight and primacy? That's a great question. Um, so I'm not sure how to put it other than to say that um, it's, it's almost not exactly that the Declaration should be given such primacy as that the potential for each and every one of us and the kids in your school to be people who are working with others to set the terms for our community, that's what should be given primacy, okay? And the Declaration is a remarkable example of doing that. So it's not that the Declaration is the be all and end all of that kind of work, it just happens to be a really, really good example. So I sort of, I do really start more from not the perspective of you know, everybody should read the Declaration because it's the, the Declaration, but you know, let me remind you, you're a political creature, okay? And you have the capacity to make this world. And what it takes is the kind of engagement and conversation and commitment to building protocols for resolving disputes, that exactly what Liz is describing. And if you want to see it in action, here's a very useful text for figuring it out. Yeah. Liz, can you suggest ways in which we can grant young people that voice that you're talking about? that young people want to be able to say how their worlds should be shaped um, for you know, a four to six year old guy who runs a nonprofit. What's the, you know, um, what are the ways in which we can help I've to shape? I've been wondering. <laughs> <laughs> um, shoot, I should have lied about my age. Um, didn't even occur to me. Um, what, you know, what can we do? I, I did three of those on the table discussions yesterday, and it was really funny to sort of do them all. One was at breakfast, one was at lunch, one was at dinner. And, um, and I mean, I don't want to give anything away, but for one of them, it was me and a bunch of rich people talking about the problems that Chicago faced, and it was the weirdest conversation <laughs> because I couldn't imagine me, much less them, in conversation with this girl who doesn't feel safe walking to Fenger High School from her house. So how do we, um, you know, how do we hear that voice that young people 
have and want to make under what conditions or what conditions do we have to create and I don't mean sort of broad sociological things but like if if in the next month the IHC decided that it wanted to sort of make a space to hear the voice of of the young people who come to your school what's really a realistic way to do that do you think yeah so uh, I also participated in on the table yesterday and it, it made me think of, first of all, I think it was a really fruitful just dialogue. I went to three of them as well. It was just a really fruitful dialogue. And it made me think about how often do students have the opportunity to interact with students or other adults or other people across our city or across our country? Like, how often do they have the chance to really engage within like that type of dialogue? you know, over a meal and like in a real safe and just in a, in a safe space. And so I think it begins like with, with just with conversations. Um, I think another great way, and I'm, I do not work for MICFA, but I will say <laughs> again <laughs> um, that MICFA really provides that space to engage students within that dynamic, within that conversation, allow them almost at that entry point because they've been doing it for so long and been working with kids. They just, and we, we, we do partner with them, um, but that does allow them that space in which to do that. And so I think it just it's just opening up and exposing students to things as well. And so they have, I think sometimes, I, I always get choked up every time I hear national anthem and they talk about, and they're singing about, you know, the the land of the free and the home of the brave. It just, I always get choked up. And I, I get choked up because I, I, sometimes I go to work and I feel like everyone's not free. We're not all free. And let's just be really clear about it. When, when, when basic, basic, like fundamental needs are not met and people have no hope and there's these things just, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I feel like, you know, they're not free sometimes, but they don't even realize they're not free. And so opening spaces and conversations and dialogues, and this exposure piece is huge because once you see there is something else, you can't turn that back. One of the things that we've tried to do every year, um, we weren't able to do it this year, but we, we tried to, we've done it every year up until this year, is expose students to a, a new place in the country. So we can only usually take like 12 or 15 kids because we can't really afford much more than that. But we went to New York, and so we went to the United Nations, we went to Times Squares, and Times Square, and then to Harlem, and just just to expose them to something then helps them realize the whole broader scope and sequence and picture of hey, I really want to be involved in this, and what does this really mean? And then once you start having those thoughts, it, I mean, it's almost like a ripple effect in terms of getting involved in the conversation. So I have two last questions to ask. I was checking my phone because my colleague Jeff is texting me questions, maybe? <laughs> or, I'm sorry, email, okay, great. So I'm gonna ask my last two questions, and I'm gonna really look at my phone for this email. Um, and then we'll do some kind of thing where people get to ask questions or, um, or give comments. And so these are my final two questions um, for both of you. And one is a question and one of them is a comment that I hope maybe inspires uh, another comment. So Danielle, I don't, I, I'm totally not gonna get this right, but um, there's a point in, in, in the book where you, um, darn, I asked you to reread that, that section today. But there's a point in the book um, when you talk about how it is that people sort of take on their equality. And you give us an example, um, uh, slaves in the South who once, I, I think it maybe once the Emancipation Procl Proclamation is made, they sort of leave their homes. They, they run away from their, um, from where they're, whatever plantations or whatever they're working on, and they join the Northern Army and or the, the Union Army. And I, I want to make sure that I understood this point right. Um, and I don't know whether it put me in, tr in thought of Native Americans or whether you mention it. I think maybe you mentioned, yeah, you do mention it because you talk about, um, about the genocide that took place with Native Americans. And I, I didn't quite understand um, the point fully, but the way I read it at the time was that slaves sort of found this way to literally fight for their freedom and that Native Americans didn't 
find the same way to fight for their freedom. And so it became a, a, a genocide. Um, I, did I understand that right, or did I get it wrong? And then the, the um, and then my last question or comment for Liz, because then I have to look at my phone, um, is depending on your answer, what kind of suggestion does that, <laughs> You know, does that have again for young people in um, in Roseland? And then um, the last thing which struck me about Chicagoland was there's this young man who, um, you know, the the kids have now started to go to college, mm -hmm. and there's this young one young man who seems like a success story. He's graduated, but he hasn't gone on to college, and you see him in this video, and you're worried that. Um, that he's sort of like um, challenging um, some folks that's maybe not productive and you're worried that there's going to be re physical violence like retaliation against him. And one of the people that you're talking to in the school says something to indicate that maybe he's been expecting it. And you say, no, 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 no. we should never expect that. And he begins to sort of explain why it's not a surprise. And you say something like, I wrote it here, um, in the end, we have to do more. Um, and you know that's sort of the, the thing that made me think, God, this woman must be exhausted all the time. <laughs> because the answer is always, no, we can't expect this kind of behavior as much as people will say that it makes sense. It means that we have to do more. So that's a ton. <laughs> Talk among yourselves. I'm going to check my phone. <laughs> well. <laughs> So um, to Anhel's question, just to clarify a little, the point that I make about how slaves achieved freedom is actually not that after the Emancipation Proclamation they joined the Union Army, but before the Emancipation Proclamation, slaves were already making their way to the Union side. Basically, they were, they were you know, making an annoyance of themselves because actually the Union Army didn't really want them at this point, but didn't, didn't want to turn them back either, and then began to realize that because as these slaves were coming over to the Union, they began to realize that this was a way of undermining the South, and so it became <coughs> pragmatically you know, intelligent to go ahead and just embrace the whole idea. And the Emancipation Proclamation solved a certain kind of law of war problem, where until that proclamation, there was some sort of legal obligation to be returning the slaves to the South, which was obviously not pragmatically a good thing to do. So the point is that slaves took their own freedom. Um, and that that's sort of the historiography of the Civil War has evolved a lot in the last 20 years, and that's a part, standard part of the narrative now. And this, I, this came up in a portion of the book where I'm talking about why is it that something like the Declaration could have these incredibly lofty ideals in it, and yet nonetheless launch a nation that sustains slavery for another 60 or so years, or more than that. And the, the point I make is that sort of, for me, it was sort of wrestling through that issue it was a part of writing this book. It's been a kind of perennial problem, right? Um, and the idea is just that, um, you know, so there's this, you've got your ideas and your ideals and you've got material realities and habits. And people can have new ideals without necessarily acquiring the new habit. So all the white residents in the colonies could have new ideals, but not necessarily make the translation from those ideals to all the specific minute things that would have to change in their lived reality. And it really required the people who were dominated under the old material realities to break through them and take something new and change it in order for the ideals to become real for everybody. That was the sort of core idea that I was trying to articulate there. So just to give a little context, so um, Lee was a, a student at our school and had been with us all four years and um, really struggled towards the beginning in his freshman and sophomore year, really heavy gang involvement, guns, like a lot of, a lot of different things were going on um, with him and choices he was making. We really, really struggled with him. And there was this kind of pivot point right between his sophomore and junior year where he just made it a decision he had we had you know wrapped all these supports around and he finally you know had because made a conscious choice and started just making different decisions and so he had joined the basketball team and started coming to school every day and so on and so forth and so he gets to basically the um end of his senior year and he's going to go to he had got sent to a college and was going to go and then he basically the long the short version of it is he he doesn't and you know, we tried to work with him over the summer and all this stuff to get him in. We're still trying to work with Lee, even though he's not our 
technically our student anymore. He's always one of our kids. And so so we're still trying to work to get him off to college. But um, it's interesting how sometimes, and this is, I think, connected to what I was talking about earlier about freedom and oppression and how like you can, through the context of community and what happens, how your mind is oppressed. And so for him, it was almost impossible for him to believe that he could go away and to do something different. And although literally his life was in jeopardy and not just from, you know, we hope he doesn't get shot on the street or we hope it doesn't happen, but there was, there's, that they never get into this on CNN, but there was this whole backstory of like, um, there was like a hit out on him and there was all this is really bad things happening. So when you think about, okay, you know, Lee, come on, like you've got this opportunity. You can go away to college where th this stuff won't be in, in, an issue. Um, he just couldn't believe that he had the, he could, he could do that. And he was very emotional about this big, you know, he's six foot four. He's like huge, you know, and he was crying to me about being scared to go. And so I think it ties back into this notion of like empowerment and freedom of like how it takes like this constant ongoing effort. If you've been oppressed for so long, like, you know, it's like it's, it's, it's being caged and it's, it's freeing someone's mind. And it takes, you know, this, I think, concerted effort to every for everyone you know because at the, at the ultimate end at the end of the story with with Lear the thousands tens of thousands of other Lees out there is if he doesn't you know make these choices or do things that are in more of a positive direction then how does that impact us as a whole and as a society right because I mean even if you don't think it's a social justice issue it's an economic issue you know I and mean, how are we you know funneling monies into prison or, you know, the welfare system or this different things like that. So I just believe, I fundamentally believe you just, you don't give up on the kids because at the end of the day, like it matters for us as a society and we're all responsible. You know, it's not just, you know, us in this room, but all of us are responsible because at the end of the day, they're still kids. I don't care what anybody says about them. You can say they're whatever, whatever, they're children. And when we start to blame our children, for issues that they face or for choices that they make, and um, it's it's a it's a real sad day. Can I add a little tiny footnote there? Sure, if you don't of mind? course. Just to say, so the book that won the Pulitzer Prize in History this year is by a historian called Alan Taylor. It's called uh, Internal Enemies, and it's about slaves that ran away during the 1812 war, ran to the British side. It's one of these funny books because you read it and you're like, go British! You're like, whoa, that's like a weird feeling. But. Um, but one of the really striking things about the book is that and he's been able to recover data of who ran away and who was connected to whom and so forth. And the amazing thing is that people wouldn't leave unless they could take their families with them. Yeah. Um, so the Twitter feed shows that um, people oftentimes have much better questions than I do. So let's take a couple of those. Um, somebody asks when and how often do public school teachers teach the, the Declaration of Independence um, or have students define um, or have students define freedom and equality for themselves and for their community? I think it varies probably from school to school so I can't speak on behalf of all of Chicago public schools. I know within the context of my school that it, it is taught and I think that we really try to push students to think about these issues. And I think that, again, ties into helping them really discover their own potential and their own empowerment and their own freedom when they're engaged in conversations like that. A question for Danielle. Um, what insights do you think uh, the Declaration of Independence has to help those organizing against inequality today, um, for example, striking fast food workers? That's a great question. Um, so I think one very useful thing it gives is an opportunity to focus on political equality and then ask what kinds of economic conditions are necessary for people to be equal in the political sphere. And that is a way of organizing the conversation about economic questions that can avoid some of the problems that you can run into um, when you start with the kind of economic inequality concept. And then that immediately sort of triggers 
people's uh, concerns about, you know, whatever, communism, socialism, and that kind of thing. And so I think if you start from political equality and can make the case of, you know, look, you know, you, you have to build a middle a foundation for the middle class. You have to build pathways into the middle class in order to achieve political equality. Um, you begin to have a more effective way of moving forward on economic questions. Great. Um, anybody in the audience want to ask a question or make a comment before I go back to Twitter? Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, I'm going to, uh, oh, someone has a, right, a cordless microphone. And so that um, Can TV can capture your question, let's start with the woman who still has her hand up. The power of participation. Exactly. Thank you up. so much. I think we all know our homework tonight, tomorrow's, read the Declaration of Independence. Um, I work with a volunteer for the last two years uh, in rebirthing the legacy um, branch for the NAACP EXO program, which is for uh, African, high African American high school youth. It's a competition, Vernon Jarrett started in 27 categories now, which includes culinary, humanities, architecture, engineering, sciences. So the last two years as the co-chair, I've been mother, educator, psychologist, social worker, and we go into the schools, public school systems, and we try and get students to participate in these 27 categories. We must mentor them and help them bring some pride in themselves. And it is a community-based effort because what I found out was we're working with kids that have are homeless, they don't have a mother or a father or barely a grandparent to help them. And all they need is a little bit of love and encouragement sometimes to let them know that they can do that. When we took some of our students that won gold medals to nationals in Orlando, Florida last year, we had to get suits for the kids. Some had never been on a plane. One of my students, this is how I first met him. Hi, my name is. When he won a silver medal, like the Olympics, he got up there and he, he was happy. He was proud of himself. And I'm still struggling now. He's graduated from Little Black Pearl, which was a challenge. And I, I took him over to Chicago State after I tried city colleges. And I said, why didn't you, why didn't you apply? Because I handed him to a man. The man just handed him some applications and walked away. I said, he said, well, I'm afraid of failing. So I had to work through that, took him over to Chicago State, took him to the criminal justice department area, and he started talking to a friend of mine, Dr. Perkins. His eyes lit up because he's, he works with glass blowing. She walked him over to admissions office. She walked him over to the president's office. Now the young man wants to go to college. And that's all he needed was a little bit of encouragement. And I think that's what we've got to do with the community, has got to work with our young people. Great. Thank you very much. Um, let's go back there. But to Sue. Yeah. So I appreciated, um, Daniel, what you said about the slaves that took that would only go with their families. Because I think that, so I went to one of those, is it on the table? I forgot, on the table conversations last night, on the South Side. And it was really interesting because it was people from all over the South Side. And we had a big discussion about whether Hyde Park counts or not. Um, <laughs> which we could go into a, at the bar later. But um, one of the things that was so strongly expressed by everybody there was a sense that everything is, that, that the powers that be would like to see everything go away from the culture of the South Side. Mm -hmm. So that it's not just the violence and the things that that young man that you're talking about are up against, but everything that he represents. And so I guess my question to you is how do we not throw the baby out with the bathwater because what I see, and I'm a person who does come from a lot of privilege, but I am a granddaughter of immigrants, and there's a huge sense of loss, and I'm a person who migrated to Chicago. There's a big sense of loss that goes with migration, whether it's to college, whether it's to 
the British, <laughs> whether it's you know, just outside your, your own comfort zone. And I don't think we talk very often about how we address loss and how we prevent that sense of loss when we ask people to make big changes. Mm -hmm. So that's my question. So I have a lot of thoughts on that one, actually. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so just to say, for, I earlier in the conversation said we can't expect principals and teachers to do everything. We need a serious reconstitution of our society. And I think you've just put your fingers on one of the key issues. So we've lost any kind of vocabulary for talking about how to connect communities to one another in a way that keeps the value in all that diversity. So we used to use the language of integration, right? And we walked away from that for good reasons, because integration was defined as assimilation, right? Like bringing people in by making them the same, like the mainstream. And so once we didn't want assimilation anymore, we just we didn't know what to do, how to talk about this. So I've started talking about trying to build a connected society. And when I talk about that, I mean, there's lots to say about that at the institutional level, the kind of policies that do a better or worse job of actually exposing people to diversity and connecting different kinds of communities with each other. That's a huge and important part of the conversation. But there's also a lot to say about whether or not, this comes back to teaching to some extent, we're teaching ourselves as adults and young people the skills it takes to interact in the world of that kind of diversity. And I, there's two parts, what I, the art of bonding, being with people with whom you have a sense of affinity, understanding the value of that cultural connection, understanding it in a way that also is about sharing it openly with the rest of the world and in mutually respectful ways. But you need, just as importantly, skills at the art of bridging. Okay, and this is, I mean, it's this weird thing where like there's stuff to know about how to be good at interacting with people who are not like yourself. And we almost never treat it as something that you can actually get better at, learn stuff about. Like we really need to do that. I mean, and this is where, from my point of view, the demographic facts of this country are that, you know, we're in a mere 20 years or whatever, for as far as 18 year olds are co concerned. I mean, we're all, you know, we're majority minority for people in the zero to two age group, okay? So in 18 years, we're majority minority for the college age group, and then another sort of 20 years, we're just playing majority minority for the whole country, okay? So it's like, we've got to figure this out. We are a different country already. And we need to understand in analytic terms and therefore how to teach it the art of bridging. Great. Thank you. Um, let me go to a question from Twitter. Um, somebody asked, what's the difference between equality and equity? Uh, a question I wish I had thought to ask. <laughs> That's a lovely question. Um, and it's a, it's a hard one to answer because it, you know, one can use either term in so many different ways. Um, but what I, I suppose would say in this context is um, equality um, is a concept where what you're trying to do is identify um, really an equivalence. I mean, so sameness is not exactly the right idea, but where you are thinking that something pertains in the same way to everybody. And so when I talk about political equality, I'm talking about the, what I've said before, we're all political creatures. We all have that potentiality to be co-creators of our world. Um, and one wants to um, tap into that potential and activate it. Um, equity is a concept that is more connected to a notion of fairness. Um, and so there are contexts in which the, an equitable outcome is um, you know, you should get more for dinner than I should get, okay? You need more than I need, and that would be an equitable outcome. Um, so there are ways in which one can refine the concepts and so forth, and they certainly are connected to each other. Uh, so in some sense, the kind of fairness entailed in equity is what you need in order to achieve equality. Um, so I tend to think about economic questions uh, with, through a framework of equity um, with the goal of achieving political equality. Great, thank you. Let's take a question from right here. Wait, uh, can you? Um, the last statement you were making about um, learning the art of mm -hmm. interacting. I'm a part of the Odyssey program. Oh, fantastic. And what I've gotten from is that, for one, I get to talk to adults. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you've been isolated, I've been raising a 17-year-old. He's right. going off to college. But the opportunity to interact and have my opinion, have mm -hmm. it heard in such a diverse mm -hmm. group, mm -hmm. and then 
being able to concede, mm -hmm. you know, my opinion and hear the other person. Mm -hmm. So th that happens in that group mm -hmm. and what I've been in for the past how many months. But that has happened, the ability to be different and be heard mm -hmm. and then take the text of what's being taught and see it differently and then have other people hear it and see it differently. Mm -hmm. You know, like the Twilight, the right. book of the Twilight, we, we just got finished with that. And for me, it, it charged me in that the book was supposed to give you the idea of what can you do to change. It wasn't just for conversation. Right. It's supposed to spark action. Mm -hmm. And I look at the book, it was written so long ago, but it's still relevant now. It's going on right now. Mm -hmm. No change has happened. No one has taken the ideas from the book and said, concrete, this has to change or this needs to be put in place. Right. So having the, the ability to conversate and you know, mm -hmm. and spark change and, and, and encourage my fellow classmates to do something, that's happening, which you're saying in the Odyssey program. I'm so glad to hear yeah, that. That's, that's terrific. Yes, right. fantastic. Thank you so much. Let's go over here. No, to, yeah. Hi, yeah, I, I, um, I was at one of the table things last night too, and I, I'm just gonna throw this out there because a concept came up, but I do have a question, which was people talked about, gee, they have sister cities. What about sister neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. And I don't just mean in Chicago, and that that would be a way of maybe giving kids a space to you know, take a field trip to uh, New Trier. But I want you guys to talk about something that hasn't been talked about yet. We both have connections to high schools in Chicago that are facing massive budget cuts. We do not, we're talking about equality. We don't fund education equally. Poor neighborhood, poor schools, rich neighborhood, rich schools. Sure, there's some exceptions and there's some magnet schools and blah, blah, blah. But that's the basic reality. And so how do we, how do we deal with the big problem that's in the room, which is we don't face this basic thing that you need to participate in a culture, in a democracy, in a free society, education, we don't fund it equally. That's my question. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, I think it's absolutely ludicrous that I need to be thinking about fundraising in a public school. And I have kids' needs who are not being met. And I think it's the notion of equity. Like the kids, our kids just need more. They need to see more dollars. And so to think to give equally to every school, you get this, every student is $5,000, um, doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. And so um, when talking about how to solve that, I think it's really, I don't know, in my mind, I feel like it's fairly simple. It's like, how, do, how, do, how are we all voting? Like, who's engaging in the voting process? Like, where are we putting our voices? And what are we standing behind? And I think that when a group of people really rises up within this country, like politicians and folks take notice. And I think that, unfortunately, and this is just this my, this is my opinion, I feel like the people at the, you know, quote, bottom of this situation um, for a variety of reasons aren't engaged within that process and others who might be at different you know a different level or whatever within that um, haven't really stood up because they people feel like and I've heard people say this well it doesn't really impact me like if if you know if this if my school if this if Fenger fails or if Harper fails or if whoever and you know in California this school fails it doesn't really impact me but the uh, bottom line it, it really does it affects our society it affects our economic interests the the status of our country and the future of our country and so I think really changing it is a matter of people rising up and saying enough is enough like here's what we need to do and I think until that happens, it's gonna be the same thing, because we've been facing it for years. I mean, it's nothing in my mind that's new. Yeah. Some would say. So um, can I add just a, a little thing there, if you don't mind? So I, when I said that when I invoke the idea of a connected society, there are a lot of institutional and policy <laughs> questions as part of that. The educational funding one is a core one. And another important way to think about that is that there are alternative models to just sort of how municipal funding works generally um, that could do a lot to change how we think about funding public education. Um, but the second thing I would say is, I mean, for me, one of the reasons, so this is back to Angel's question about why should you tell your friends to read a book about the Declaration of Independence? 
<laughs> I was like, we have to rebuild a public commitment to public goods, among which is education. And from my point of view, I think the, the sort of libertarian and liberty related arguments have been by far the dominant ones in our culture for the last few decades. And I think more of us have taken them in than we realize. I and mean, so it doesn't impact me is a, is a very good kind of liberty orientation. Like my liberty is fine, right? But if you, ha if you have to look at it through the lens of, are we achieving a democracy which requires achieving, achieving egalitarian empowerment, then you know, no, like you don't even have the thing you think you want. You think you have liberty, but you don't actually, because ultimately the whole thing's not stable because we're not actually grounding it on equality. So for me, you know, the reason to tell your friends to read that book is to help them recover an awareness that the sort of liberty concept's not enough. Thank you. Um, so, Oh, goodness. Um, how about the blonde woman over there? Hi, um, my name is Emily. I, I just wanted to thank you both, first of all, for the passion that you bring to not just your work, but how it transcends into your personal lives. I think that it's a lot rarer than we realize it, that it is. I'm a social worker, and I work with older foster youth who are facing um, aging out of care and or emancipating from the system when they turn 21. And one of the things I'm trying to um, partner with them to do is to become, as you have talked about, political beings and sort of realize the capacity they have to be their own best advocates. And I love the way that you pointed out that we don't really as much need to give them things as we need to sort of stand back and listen to what they can offer to us. And so a lot of my work is to push back against the sort of savior mentality that unfortunately pervades a lot of the child welfare system. And so right now I'm trying to work with them to sort of become politicized and to raise their voices and to realize what does it mean to do something as simple as go online and, and send a form letter to your congressional representative. So recently, I, um, on behalf of our group, I sent a, an inquiry for a meeting to Danny K. Davis. And when and I work for a large social service agency, which I will not name, but I was, I was told that I needed to sort of hold off and make sure that our development department wasn't already working with this particular uh, elected official. Because unfortunately, we do need to prioritize funding and the continuation of our programs in that way. And so a lot of times we're exploiting our youth to make sure that they're PR ready and that the things that they're going to say when they're meeting these folks are the things we want them to say, which may not necessarily be their real truth or their real lived reality. And so now I'm thinking if I do get the opportunity to sort of either go rogue or get the green light and take them to, to meet Danny K. Davis, before we can really talk about, initially my thought was I want to have them talk about what is it like to be a youth in care, what is it like to have your supports come to such as they are, come to an abrupt end when you turn 21. But now I feel like I, I need to, before I can even talk to them about bringing that to Danny K. Davis, to talk to them about just going into that space and saying, why do I have to feel like you're doing me a favor by hearing me talk to you right now? And why do I have to feel like the, the agency that represents my case and my well-being and survival in so many ways needed to be sure that before they let me come here that they didn't need to usurp my opportunity to speak out to make sure that they continue to get the visibility or the funding that they need. So I'm wondering if you have any advice about how to frame for young people their rights in terms of being politically active and being able to be in those spaces and own them without feeling like the first thing they should say is thank you. Um, as opposed to, this is what I think I deserve and what I think you, you owe me, because one day I will hopefully be voting either for you or for someone else. So that's my question. So I suppose I would say that instead of having them start with thank you, I would encourage them to start with something like, I'm glad to be here with you thinking about this. So in other words, I think you can use small things to indicate a very different stance and orientation. And it would just give a little thought to like, what are those small phrases that convey you know, adult, mutual, and egalitarian engagement in addressing an important collective problem. Anything to add? I agree with that. And um, 
I've often felt the same way, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very funny and odd thing when you think like you have, you go into these different spaces sometimes, even as an adult and feel like you're asking for a favor to get money to provide basic needs for someone, you know? Um, and so I've often given my students similar tips, um, in terms of like, you know, how they're interacting with adults. Um, it was one of the reasons why, and you know, there was, there's a whole another story to this, but you know the student that if you if you watch the show on Chicago Land, a couple of students that were featured on there, like Lee and a few others and Jason, and you know some might have said, well, why why would you put those why why those kids? And my thing, I, and I felt, I mean, they they had free kind of range of the school. Like I, I don't have time to really manage and you know them the CNN people. Like I have other stuff to do. But if you want to follow me around, great. Um, so they naturally picked up on students that I was I was connected with, but I think that they tell a very important story that often gets left out of the equation that people don't know about. And so I think that's that is part of giving um, voice to the voiceless sometimes and, and, and empowering folks. And so giving them that space and that narrative. So now that that I don't know how to say this, but that that, that it, just, it just opens up that larger that larger space for them to have their voices heard. Um, so the, um, you know, the mission of the Humanities Council is to strengthen society by fueling inquiry and conversation. And I'm astounded by the level of conversations that people have and want to have. Um, and we're really motivated by the importance of these conversations to building a society that serves us all well. So I want to thank all of you for coming tonight and for having this conversation with us. Um, I want to say that the conversation can continue a little while with the folks who are here um, outside, but then there's a band coming to play. So <laughs> I hope that you'll carry the conversations with you among yourselves and with your friends um, and your colleagues and everyone else. And I really want to thank um, Liz and Danielle for sparking such, a, such an important conversation. So thank you both for being with us tonight. Thank you, Angel. Thank you.